Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the book of Philippians. It's a little book in the back of the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul is writing to a church that he loved dearly. And he's writing them to encourage them, to lift them up and to strengthen them. And in Philippians, such a small book, it may be the most encouraging book in the whole of the Bible. And I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 through 16. And this is what it says. I do not mean that I'm already as God wants me to be. I've not yet reached that goal, but I continue trying to reach it and make it mine. Christ wants me to do that, which is the reason he made me his. Brothers and sisters, I know that I have not yet reached that goal, but there is one thing I always do, forgetting the past and straining toward what is ahead. I keep trying to reach the goal and get the prize for which God has called me through Christ to life above. All of us who are spiritually mature should think this way too. And if there are things you do not agree with, God will make them clear to you. But we should continue following the truth we already have. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, breathe your spirit on us that we may follow you and, and know life. It's full and abundant. Thank you for this day and for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Story about a stockbroker who made piles of money. He was doing incredibly well in the stock market. And so he, uh, he wanted to make sure that he surrounded himself with some of those symbols that pointed to his success. He bought a Rolex watch that was $20,000. A beautiful, beautiful watch. He bought a brand new Lamborghini first time he drove it to the city he was hoping to get a spot in the parking deck but that's not what happened instead he had to park on the street and as he was opening his door wham truck came just knocked the door of his brand new Lamborghini knocked it right off he jumped out and he started crying he said my, my Lamborghini my Lamborghini my beautiful Lamborghini well a cop was standing right there and he said Lamborghini nothing the fellow knocked your arm off the guy looked down to where his arm used to be and he said my Rolex, my Rolex, my beautiful Rolex. <laughs> I like that story a lot. You know, sometimes we get our priorities confused. Things that are essential, we get them confused with things that are only important. Paul is trying to, to get folks to focus on the things that are essential. And that essential is life in Jesus Christ. Paul always points to Jesus. And he gives thanks again and again through Jesus Christ. And that's what he does right here in maybe the most encouraging book in the whole of the Bible. He says, I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it in the day of Christ Jesus. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He points to Jesus and he points to the to the power that Jesus gives in the everyday, in the ordinary of life. And he sets his life as exhibit A. Exhibit A 
of what a transformed life is to look like. A life that's been transformed through Jesus Christ. And here this morning, while he's, he's, he's writing to the Philippians, he's writing to you and me too. And that he says right here in verse 13, he says, there's one thing that I always do. Now, that's priority when he says there's one thing that I already always do. That's the priority. The one thing that I always do, forgetting the past and strain towards what lies ahead. Forgetting. For a lot of us, it comes pretty natural. But Paul, he's, he says, remember to forget. That's the one thing is, is to remember to forget. Culver Military Academy up in Indiana has a long history of, of giving fantastic discipline to young men and women and a good education as well. And one of their traditions is at the time of graduation, they, to, re- to receive their diploma, they walk across the stage, shake hands with the headmaster of the school, the commandant, they receive their diploma, and then they walk through a symbolic archway. And to go through the archway, they have to open a gate. And when they open the gate and get to the other side, there's someone standing on the other side who says, remember to close the gate. Well, it's a part of the tradition that, yes, this is a high achievement. Yes, this is a great accomplishment but press on toward the future. That even the high achievement, the great accomplishment, it's in the past. You can't stay here. You must keep going and and close the gate. Well, that's what Paul's saying. Close the gate. Close the gate. Well, what what is Paul urging us to close the gate to? I, I, I think Paul, maybe more than anyone else in Scripture, Closes the gate to bitterness. Paul, the minute he began following Jesus Christ, his life began to change. And it it didn't become one of those stories where suddenly he became healthy, wealthy, and wise. No, Paul, when he began to, to allow Jesus to live his life through him, four times he was shipwrecked. Three times he was beaten with rods. Five times he was beaten with whips. One time they threw rocks at him till they thought he was dead. And now when he writes this letter of encouragement, he's writing it from prison. If ever there was somebody who, who had cause to be bitter, to practice all the bad things that had happened to him and rehearse it again and again, it's Paul. But that's not what Paul does. Instead, Paul closes the gate to bitterness. And he moves forward. He moves forward and he encourages others. You and me to do the same thing as well. Barbara Brockoff tells a story about a home in North Georgia that the the lawn was beautifully manicured. There were flowers everywhere. The house was freshly painted. And there was one more thing. There was a huge pile of of trash in the front yard. It wasn't a trash to be hauled off. It was a a pile of trash to be displayed. So much so that the owner even put a, a sign in front of that pile of trash. And he lighted the sign. And the sign said, this is Alcoa aluminum siding, 30 year warranty, it's junk. That he was so bitter, so angry against the siding people, he wanted to make sure that everyone knew and he was willing to trash his own yard, his own property, his own home so that others might know how bitter he was in order to get even. And they're, they're stories, they're stories that, that we all choose to be earmarks of our lives. Stories that we practice, stories that we rehearse, and we get to choose these stories. Sometimes I'll meet with couples before a wedding and I'll ask them how they met and they have stories, wonderful stories about how they met, how they fell in love, and what those, those 
key moments in life were and, and we're preparing for the wedding for another key moment in life. And they, they have these stories that they love to tell, that they love to rehearse, that they love to practice again and again and again. The best stories, the stories that are encouraging to each other, that lift each other up. And, and in everyone's life, other stories come in. Sometimes these stories are of an injury or a slight. And that couples sometimes began to rehearse those stories and practice the bitterness, practice the injury, practice the slight, and who was right and who was wrong, and who's on one side and who's on the other. Practicing those stories, yes, it separates us from other people. Practicing those stories with God, how we didn't get what we deserve, yes, it, it separates us from God. Practicing those stories in any organization of who's right and who's wrong, and it separates us. Life in Jesus Christ was never made where we practiced bitterness. Paul is call, using his life as exhibit A and he's calling us to close the gate, to press on to what lies ahead. Close the gate to bitterness, but it's not only bitterness, it's also pride. Pride. Here in, in verse 5, Paul begins to to read his resume. In Philippians 3, verse 5, he says, I was circumcised eight days after my birth. I'm from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew and my parents were Hebrews. I had a strict view of the law, which is why I became a Pharisee. I was so enthusiastic, I tried to hurt the church. No one could find fault with the way I obeyed the law of Moses. Paul is, is showing us his trophy case. He was born of a people who were proud to be the chosen people of God. And not only that, he was born of the most proud, the tribe of Benjamin. The first king of Israel was chosen from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul's showing us his trophy case. He's reading his resume. He comes from royal blood. Thank you very much. He's pointing out his politics. He was a Pharisee. He wasn't just any old Pharisee, though. That he measured up above all the other Pharisees. He's pointing to his trophy case. He's pointing to his resume. He's pointing to his accomplishments. And what does he do with them? Well, verse 8 tells us what he does with them. He says, I count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He takes them to the dump. He tosses them out. He throws them away. He closes the gate to those very things that everyone else would call accomplishments. He closes the gate to pride. John H. Holliday was the founder of the Indianapolis News it's a newspaper. I don't know if you remember those or not, but one day he was reading his own newspaper and he was, <laughs> he, he read a story where the word height, H-E-I-G-H-T, was misspelled, that someone had left out the E in the story. And he was so disturbed by it that he wanted to find out not only who wrote the story, but who was the one who proofread the story. That in his paper, not only was a misspelled word, did a misspelled word get by, it got by the editor and the, it got by the, the, the proofreader. So he, he commissioned a, an investigation and what was discovered was he was the one who wrote the story and he was the one who proofread it. So as the founder, as the owner, as the boss, what did he do? Well, and he said from that point on, any time the word height was printed in his newspaper, they would leave out the E. <laughs> pride. Pride sometimes, sometimes it makes us do silly things. Most often, it makes us do devilish things. Paul. 
Paul had more reason to brag than anyone else. But he takes it to the dump. He hauls it off. And I think nowadays, there's kind of an in, inverted pride. That it's not so much a pride in our holiness and our saintliness. I think there's something that's crept in, especially with, with Christians. That we identify ourselves not with the saints, not with the holy. Instead, I think there's something that's crept into Christianity that identifies not with the saints, but instead with the sinners. And says, well, at least I'm not like those people over there. You know, they're judgmental. And there becomes a pride in our, our tolerance, a pride in our ability to be non judgmental, not like them. And it's still pride, a pride that divides us. Pride divides us, yes, in the family. It divides us, yes, in any organization, and it divides us, yes, in the church. Jesus didn't come to live his life through you and me, so we would choose by either being holy or being non judgmental. That he calls us to a life that's impossible to live on our own. A life where we're holy and non judgmental. That you and I are nothing more than a sinner saved by grace. And we're nothing less than a child of God. That on the cross, Jesus took all those things that would divide us, destroy us, and keep us enslaved. He took the sin. He took the shame and he took the pride. And he nailed it to the cross to take away its power once and for all that he might live his life through us. And the ground beneath the cross, it's level ground. It's not where one is higher than the other. It's where we all, where we all live leaning on Jesus, trusting in Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, and not a result of works that no one should boast. It's Jesus. Jesus. Jesus who has power that we don't have. Close the gate to pride, and to close the gate to bitterness. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is that he has strength. Strength we don't have that'll close the gate to failure. Edgar Dwight Jones tells a story about a time where he was preaching, and at the end of his sermon, he invited folks to receive Jesus into their lives. And as the last song was playing, a huge man came rushing down the aisle. Tears were streaming down his face. And he, he ran up to Ed, Edgar Dwight Jones and began to, to shake his hand. And this is what he said. He said, Preacher, you said tonight that God could save anybody, no matter who they are or what they've done. I want to believe that. I want him to save me. But I want you to know I've done everything. I've done it all. I've broken the Ten Commandments, all of them. I'm a Swedish blacksmith by trade, and I've been a terrible sinner. I don't know whether God can help me or not. Edgar Dwight Jones looked him in the eye and said, Tonight, you're in luck. God specializes in Swedish blacksmiths. I don't know where you are, and I don't know what you've done. But I do know that Jesus has power, power to forgive all that is past. The way the psalmist puts it is that his forgiveness casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. But the problem is we go looking for it. That 
We go looking for it so we can rehearse that failure. That we can practice the failure. That we can remember it again and again and again. Jesus has power that you and I don't have. It's a power that, that Paul knew in his life and it's, it's a power that I want to invite you to receive in your life this morning. It's the power of the risen Christ. Yes, he died on the cross to forgive us and he rose from the grave to give us power that we might close the gate to failure. That we leave it behind us once and for all. That we close the gate to pride that would divide us. And we close the gate to bitterness. This morning I want to pray with you. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, this day breathe the power of your spirit on all within sound of my voice. That this day might be a, a fresh start, a new beginning where we close the gate we forget what lies behind and we, we press forward to what lies ahead. Lord, we need your strength to do that because I think there's some folks that have been practicing their failures, rehearsing their failures again and again and again as if maybe there's some, supposed to be something religious about it. There's not. And it's, it's not the way that you would live your life through us. It's not the way you lived your life through Paul. And we ask for your power to, to close the gate to our failures because we don't have the strength to do that. Lord, also know that they're, they're folks who, who've been looking in their own trophy cases, their own accomplishments, and their own resumes. It's the most natural thing in the world to do. Lord, you have strength we don't have. Strength to, to toss out the trash, the rubbish, to take it to the dump. That pride, that pride that we would want to live on our past accomplishments and, and not your power and not your strength. Pride will always leave us divided and disappointed and we don't need to live much of life to know that. Breathe new life into us. A new creation. It's where you live your life through us and close the gate to pride. And there may be folks that are in the middle of relationships right now that they've been practicing and rehearsing bitterness. You have just the strength we don't to close the gate to bitterness. And may this be a new day, a fresh start, that we forget what lies behind and we press on to what lies ahead, that that relationship with you, that you give us strength every morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. 
that the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.